I want to thank you for joining us today for the Education Summit. My name is Mark Stewart, and I'm an, an, I'm an account manager with the Esri Higher Education team. And some of you may actually be universities that I work with regularly. So I say hi to you, and if we haven't met before, I hope that we do get a chance to meet in the future. I want to thank you for coming to this panel discussion on pedagogies for engaging students online. I think this is more than ever a really relevant topic for us. And we're very pleased to have three great panelists here to share their experience and their insights, Beth King, Charlotte Smith, and Joseph Strobel. So as a way of getting started, we'd like to begin with a very brief poll. So, oh, we've also got Angie Lee here to help kind of keep us straight and help us with logistics and everything like that, okay? And she may be kind of fielding, you know, some of the questions for answering a little bit later on. So I see that the poll is up there. If you could please go ahead and put in an answer to that. It's very quick. All right. So, yeah, let's go ahead and begin by taking a look at some of the, uh, the poll results. So the first question I asked is, what is your experience level with um, online or remote teaching? And there's a good percentage of you that have done this a lot. There's also a, another, like about a third that are beginners. Some have not done it all, but the majority of you have answered that you have moderate experience with this. So what that tells me is that there's a big chunk of you that may have your own insights and your own tips to share as well. And that's gonna be very valuable in discussion. And I hope that everybody here has something to learn from this. The second question is, do you anticipate teaching more online classes in the future? And I think this kind of went without saying, but I did want to kind of get that confirmation. And most of you have indicated that you do. Some of you are unsure. And then there is a small fraction that doesn't anticipate uh, teaching more online classes in the future. And for that 3%, I would say that don't be too sure. Because I think we've all seen that there are some uh, real changes taking place in education, and they may be more permanent than we had originally thought. And so finally, I asked, do you struggle to stay focused or engaged when you yourself are participating in online training, online classes or seminars? And most of you indicate that you are. And so that is a struggle for us. And that means it's also going to be a struggle for our students as well. <laughs> so I also indicate that, you know, about 20% of you uh, said, uh, wait a minute, was, I was checking email, which means that you were distracted as well. So thank you for participating in that poll. I think that actually does provide um, sort of a great transition into the, the, uh, the thoughts that our uh, panelists have to share and also um, the discussion that's likely to follow. So let's go ahead and first get to just some short introductions to our panelists. They will actually share a little bit more context about where they're coming from in regards to online learning. And uh, then we'll let them talk for a little bit. And then we'll come back and, and have a discussion and answer as many questions as we can. So. To begin with, I'd like to introduce uh, our three panelists here. First, Beth King. Beth teaches in Penn State University's online geospatial education programs, which include two master's degrees and graduate level certificate programs that reach students studying all over the country and the world. Next, we have Charlotte Smith. Charlotte splits the year between the University of California Berkeley School of Public Health and ITESO in Guadalajara, Mexico. She teaches both online and on campus to undergraduate and graduate students. And then finally, we have Joseph Strobel. Joseph is a co-founder of the worldwide UniGIS online program, and that's a pioneer in GIS distance learning. And he also teaches undergraduate and advanced courses at the Department of Geoinformatics at the University of Salzburg in Austria. And like I said, we're very pleased to have these panelists with us today. And so with that, 
I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Beth King first, and she's going to share her thoughts with us. So Beth, you can go ahead and share your screen. And I'll turn my video off for the time being. And then you can unmute yourself when you're ready. We do see your uh, PowerPoint presentation in the thumbnail mode. There we go. Can you hear me? Can you see it? Good. Great. And you can hear me too? Yes, we can. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Mark. Okay, so I'm happy to be here today um, and looking forward to hearing how what everybody else has to share about their strategies as well. Uh, I just want to give a little bit of information about our programs just to give some some context as Mark said. Um, Penn State offers programs in GIS, geospatial intelligence, geodesign, remote sensing and earth observation, geospatial programming and web mapping and spatial data science. Uh, our programs have served a lot of students in the 20 plus years since we started online. We had a student at McMurdo Station in Antarctica, which is how we're able to say all seven continents there. Uh, the average age of the students in our program is 36. We have a great network of alumni who help each other uh, find jobs and get, send us jobs to post to our jobs board. You can see there that they have uh, many different employers and job titles. We have over 25 faculty members. Some of our faculty teach online classes only, some teach resident and online classes, and some of our faculty are working professionals in the industry who enjoy teaching a class or two a year. Our classes span topics in GIS uh, programming, geoint, remote sensing, and geodesign. We have a team of learning designers who, that work with our faculty, and I'll talk a little bit more about our learning designers on the next page. Um, we offer flexibility in terms of when our classes are offered and in shaping individual study plans for each of our students. We recommend that students take no more than one class per term if they're working full time, which most of them are, uh, but you can take as few classes as you want in a year, so you don't have to go along with a cohort. And then we have our classes include many types of software and technology, which you can see there. Okay, so as far as engaging students online, um, as I mentioned on the first slide, flexibility is very important uh, in our program and, uh, and online. We have students in many different time zones, so synchronous, synchronous activities don't really work. Uh, there are elements to our classes that have some live components, but students are not required to attend any live sessions. Um, and if the information is important to learning, then they're recorded so that students can access it later. Uh, plans and structure are good. We have weekly assignments that are due, but we do need to be able to adapt and evolve. Uh, interaction between instructors and students and then between students and their peers in the class is really important for online learning to be effective. Students need to feel connected to the instructor and other students in the class. Uh, we have collaborative activities, group discussions, and other forms of student-to-student -student interaction. Uh, our classes differ depending on the instructor, but they all have elements of um, that encourage interaction. Uh, one of the classes I teach is called Making Maps That Matter with GIS. Uh, that one has discussion forums, voice thread activities, and self-assessments, among other things. Uh, the self-assessments are questionnaires that rate students' awareness, understanding, and ability to perform concepts and tools as they go through the class. If discussions are well designed, a lot of really meaningful interaction can take place. Uh, our students are encouraged to read uh, and respond to each other quite often in our classes. Um, and instructor participation is obviously important in discussion forums, but knowing when to limit responses is also important because sometimes too much instructor presence in discussions can decrease student participation. Uh, regular assignments and regular and quality feedback on, on assignments is very important. And having well-designed classes is especially important online. Uh, e each of our classes has a learning designer, 
and they help us design, develop, and manage our online classes and programs. Uh, they stay up to date on the latest research in education and technology and develop innovative online resources. So they really help us with that. So we, you know, we obviously try to stay on top of it as well, but um, they're a great resource for, for that. Uh, they help us deliver high quality, engaging educational experiences. Uh, our classes are oriented toward learning as a process with some formative and summative assessments. Uh, most of our classes are project based to keep students engaged with the material and not just doing lots of reading. Uh, next bullet here is openness. We, we like to have as much open content as we can. Not all of our classes are open, but many of them are. Uh, Penn State has uh, open.ed at PSU which is high quality learning materials written by Penn State faculty and they are freely available to use, revise, and redistribute under a Creative Commons license. So we have a lot of students who find us this way. Um, they use some of the open content to see if our program is right for them and then uh, they might register to get access to the instructor and graded assignments. Uh, content obviously needs to be current and relevant to keep students engaged. Uh, since the technology is ever changing, um, you know, we have to, to really stay up to date on things. A lot of our classes use online texts that we develop. Uh, it's easier to keep those up to date as opposed to a textbook that may only get revised every few years. Uh, we always use the latest version of the software, so that also keeps us on our toes. Um, and then uh, supportive um, students and educators are people who need support and not just accommodation. So we're, how, we're really proud of how much personal attention we give to our students. Um, we tailor our programs to fit our students based on their previous education and experience. Uh, we do entrance interviews with every master's student to create a course plan. Um, also, uh, speaking of being supportive of faculty, if, if Penn State hires a faculty member who will be teaching online, they do have classes available for them to take, such as uh, essentials of online teaching, assessment of online learners, teamwork and online teaching and learning, to name a few. Um, and our students are almost always working full time. They have families and lots of other things going on in their lives, so we do everything we can to support them. Uh, we have an alumni map so that prospective students can reach out to graduates in their area to hear what they liked or didn't like about our programs. So they don't have to just take our word for it. Um, and that map is an opt-in process. So if a student's phone number or email address is there, then those students are or alumni are willing to be contacted. And then finally, we have a lot of students who come to graduation. Here's one of our students, Angie, who came to campus to cap off her uh, master's degree and we always have a reception before or after the graduation ceremony for our students and their families so it's a nice way to get to meet some of our students usually we only get to meet them at conferences or or other um, you know events that happen throughout the year so this is a really nice opportunity for us to meet some of our students that's it Hey, thank you so much, Beth. That was really interesting. You know, as you were going through the different points, I was thinking, you know what, there probably needs to be a prize for coming up with a mnemonic or uh, um, like an acronym for those things that you listed, you know, supportive, relevant, you know, and, and everything. And so I was trying to do that myself as I was listening, but I didn't come up with anything good. So riff, fos, or anyway. So if anyone comes up with something better by the end of today's uh, session, then go ahead and, and let us know. But right now, we're going to move ahead with Charlotte Smith. And so Charlotte, you can go ahead and share your screen. Are you able to see the slides? Looks great. All right. And we can hear you fine. Thank you. Okay. So thank you, Mark. So before I begin, I really want to express my admiration and appreciation for the Johns Hopkins team. We've used the dashboard extensively at the School of Public Health with our students, um, even having them create the dashboard from scratch as a learning exercise. So we, we really admire what's happening at Johns Hopkins at the University of California, Berkeley. 
where I'm a faculty member in the School of Public Health. And I'm both involved with our online Master of Public Health program, as well as the on-campus program where, I, as Mark said, I teach both undergraduates and graduate students. The class I teach in our online Master of Public Health program is Applied GIS for Public Health. And that course material is primarily built on Esri's Learn Lessons, or where I am using my own lessons, I sort of pattern them after the format of the Learn Lessons, which are extremely easy to follow. That course has all graduate students, mostly mid-career professionals, about 50 students each semester. Then on campus, I teach health, human health and the environment in a changing world, which is a new branding for what we all know as Introduction to Environmental Health Sciences. This is a required course for the undergraduate public health major. So students have to take this class and they're coming in not even knowing how to spell GIS. So it's a completely different experience than the online masters. Uh, course where that's an elective course students are taking it because they really want to learn um, how to apply GIS in their profession and then I also teach a drinking water and health class so as a dr drinking water um, focus class and coming from 30 years on the water sector of course maps are integrated into um, pr pretty much every lesson. That class is a case-based course, so I want the students to sort of pick up on how maps are being used in the water sector and also spatial analysis. So I, because these are introductory classes, the key thing is sort of, as they say, meet the students where they are. And especially the undergrads, they know all about um, pizza in Berkeley and where to find it, but they might not think about their use of Yelp to find uh, the pizza places and if they're open and how many stars and what the phone number is and what the cost is, what the reviews are, the things that we think of attributes, they're just using. So we start by, as I say, meet them where they are, working with what they already know and just giving a new language. So in these introductory courses, the spatial literacy and acquiring language of spatial analysis is sort of a key thing. So we start, as I say, with what they know already. And then the second thing I do in all three classes is, especially now in the area, in the era of shelter in place, is to find out where my students are. And I've found the Esri uh, story map called Shortlist extremely helpful for this. That's one of the templates that um, is available through the online platform. So either Mac or PC users can use this. And basically, we're, they just um, need to fill in a, one row in a Google Sheet. And again, most of the students already use Google Sheets and Google Docs. So it's a, a very easy on-ramp to learning and using um, GIS software. So here you can see uh, the spreadsheet that was used to create this map. And what, why this was useful for me is it told me that um, at this time when we're not at the Berkeley campus that I have students in many different time zones. So I needed to adjust my office hours and discussion sections to accommodate those students. And when I'm creating my own lesson, I, I sort of use the learn lesson format where the, uh, what the student should see on their screen matches the direction. So they, they know because I'm not there walking around the room and looking over shoulders, the student themselves knows that they're in the right place, their, their screen looks like what it should. So again, I'm, I'm using sort of this step-by-step this is what you should see format. And it works quite well. I um, get positive feedback from the students in terms of their acquisition of this, these skills. The challenges in these courses really depend, again, whether it's mid-career professionals 
that are taking an elective course because they want to learn. And we have a lot of medical doctors in that class who haven't uh, really used uh, software or data acquisition, even Excel, in many, many years. So the challenge, big challenge there for their final project, which is a story map that has to include at least three maps to demonstrate the skills that they've acquired, let's say proximity analysis or suitability analysis or cluster, um, uh, finding clusters and Moranzi, those sort of things. Uh, they need to demonstrate that in a story map. In fact, my favorite map two years ago was from a student and it was called are we ready for the next pandemic which was quite interesting at any rate so um because those students need to create maps from scratch they need to find spatial data sets of interest and we have a library guide which i'll show you on the next slide that's publicly available under um, community commons license so you can access the university of california Berkeley's library guide for spatially enabled data sets of interest to your students. We're happy to share that with you. And then, as I mentioned, these mid-career professionals are often not so adept at using Excel, you know, converting it to a CSV so they can upload it easily into ArcGIS Online. So I really like the Layla Garani's uh, YouTube's on Excel. I think she's fantastic. So a lot of times if um, I just sort of direct the students to, to that to increase their Excel skills. And then for my undergrads in the Intro to Environmental Health Sciences class, the big challenge again, because it's a large, you know, 200 student undergrad class the, that's required, the challenge is uh, keeping these students challenged and and inspired um, to stay with it, especially when I'm not there in the room, you know, having eye contact. So the key there, I think, is the case-based learning, as Beth also uh, talked about in her course, having things be project-based and case-based and really ad adaptable um, and incorporated into what they know and what they're interested in. Uh, really works. I mean, at Berkeley, students are very socially progressive. They're very much into understanding like the disparities in health, um, social disparities in health, how that relates to different things that we're learning. So we can bring in, you know, things such as redlining and how the history there led to um, questions in health related to environmental justice social disparities of health, et cetera. And another key thing for the undergrads, I think, is peer learning. And also just having one-on-one -on -one time with the professor. So I have about an hour a day where I'll have four 15-minute one-on-one times. And throughout the semester, that gives pretty much every student individual time, and especially for those thinking about med school and grad school. They really want that that one on one time to tell me about their goals and aspirations and then be able to ask for a letter of rec. So related again to finding data sets for projects, the um, public health librarian Michael Schollenbeck has created an awesome library guide and you see the, the link there. Um, you're welcome to use that. I've pulled out a, a few of the the data sets that are available, you know, with links on that library guide, you can see here, of course, Living Atlas of the World, Esri's curated data set, which I think has about 4,000 layers now. Some are images alone, but some have uh, our feature layers that, that you can use or that the students can use. Of course, American Community Survey, uh, world Development Indicators from World Bank. You can see the list here. And of course, as I said, you're welcome to access Berkeley's library guide and use those publicly available or link to those publicly available data sets. The other key thing I've found, especially for the undergrads, is 
peer learning through things like um, jigsaws or um, what's called think, pair, share. So we use Zoom as the platform for our online class now that we've switched to um, online learning from the campus. And so I have, you know, in Zoom, it's easy to go, you can pick the number of students in the breakout groups. And sometimes I use two for the, think about what I just said, you're pairing up and share your impression or your understanding. And as Einstein said, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. So the students should be able to explain to each other the major concepts from the lecture. And that's also a good way to sort of check in with the students in that online platform. You know, I'm only seeing about, what, 24 little images of the students as opposed to seeing all 200 in the room at the same time and being able to gauge whether or not they're with me. So that's, that think, pair, share has worked quite well. So I'll turn it back to you, Mark. Thank you for your attention and I look forward to seeing questions in the Q&A. Thank you, Charlotte. That was terrific. I really like the integration of Google Sheets and your uh, shortlist story map to indicate where students are when you're in a remote learning environment. Um, so one of the things that I didn't mention in my introduction is that prior to me being an account manager with the higher ed team, I had a long career at Esri in the training department and uh, doing a lot of online training as well. And that, well, even in conventional classroom training, the story maps allowing students from all over the place to show, you know, where they're coming from, I think is a great way to kind of get started with GIS, but also, uh, you know, to make everyone feel like they're in one place for a learning experience. Uh, and I like the integration of the Google Sheets there too. I think that's something that I'll adopt. All right, well, thank you, Charlotte. And now uh, we're, it's time to go to our final panelist, Joseph Strobel. And so I'm going to go ahead and turn the sharing over to Joseph. Turn off my video. Joseph, it looks like you're uh, screen is being shared properly. Uh, I hope so, and I hope you can hear me well too. Yes, and we can hear uh, you as well. Welcome everyone. Thanks to Angie and Mark for setting up the session, having me this afternoon, my time. And yeah, thanks to, to Beth and Charlotte for already mentioning a lot of uh, highly relevant and engaging points. Uh, let me start by pointing out that my background, and Mark, you mentioned some of that already uh, earlier today, is to teach in graduate and undergraduate programs, traditional residential programs. Uh, and at the same time, and I have to admit that goes back to the early 1990s, 90s, so that means kind of uh, not really internet-based in those days yet, uh, with a distance learning program. So when we ran into the COVID-19 situation earlier this year, uh, quite a few people, and to some degree, maybe that even included myself, were thinking, well, great, let's just switch over, take the distance learning experience and apply it to the uh, residential programs. Well, that certainly was not going to happen simply because the target audiences are completely different. Distance learning programs, I believe Beth has mentioned in the Penn State program, the uh, average age of 36. So this is mature people. Most of them are in-service professionals. So their mindset, their expectations, the way and experience of learning and developing themselves, their responsibility, their experience with time management, is entirely different from uh, undergraduate students. So I'd like to focus a little bit on those differences uh, and just throw in a couple of keywords um, to maybe a start us for discussion a little bit later. So I'll focus on three topics, the uh, essentials of managing time, communications and media. Uh, and of course, since this graphic is moving a little bit, you're yeah, entirely focused on that. 
Uh, and uh, a key point there is this kind of elephant in the room uh, is uh, isolation. Isolation as a fact of uh, the counterpart of the strengths of online learning. And the strengths of online learning, e-learning, whatever kind of focus and term we'd like to use here, clearly is the individualization of the learning process. This is certainly good, and that's a strength for mature in-service professionals. Uh, for undergraduates, that means more isolation. So how to counter that, how to manage that, how to make a strength out of that uh, weakness, maybe. So uh, let me start with the time factor. So with undergraduate students, it was very clear about um, I keep their schedule. I did not mess with the class schedule, with the schedule of courses in the weekends throughout the semester. Uh, the bonus was when we were starting at eight in the morning, they didn't have to travel to the university. Uh, they did not have to switch on the cameras if they didn't like their own hairdo. Uh, but I definitely wanted to keep a tight schedule as opposed to our more mature distance learning students. Certainly there was uh, an attempt on my part to uh, work in smaller steps to have shorter feedback cycles, uh, to break, say, a 45-minute or a 90-minute lecture into quite a few smaller uh, items, which all required some activities in between. I learned to be very careful with breaks because I found out that uh, not everyone was coming back after the break. Uh, that, of course, happens in residential settings just as well, but it's just so easy to walk away from the screen presence. Um, of course, with longer sessions, it's important to have some kind of a break to refill our coffee mugs, uh, having other kind of comfort break mugs. Uh, but then I was trying to make sure I give everyone a small individual a group assignment and then take it up as a feedback of the activity after that break. So, uh, overall, uh, it means that we have much less of a captive audience in an electronic communication settings than in a physical environment, so we need to work on that quite a bit. Well, learning certainly is all about communication and what we can do in that respect depends a lot on size of class, on type of class, and the level of experience, media, expectations, so there is no catch on. But certainly, um, I'm, I'm actually curious in, in a couple of weeks time when I maybe will be back in my first face-to-face -face class with residential students. Maybe, I'm not sure about that yet. Um, maybe I feel strange and embarrassed uh, with a couple of real life, real world students in front of me because over the last months, I was got so much used to talking to my computer screen, talking into the camera, uh, that maybe it will be really strange to have live people in front of me again. Uh, but then we all know that this uh, instantaneous feedback we get by looking at students. And I believe Charlotte has mentioned uh, the, the video streams be those 20, that's manageable. If it's 200 or 400, like we would be right now, that might be difficult. And, if someone uh, makes some grimace, uh, looks at their neighbors with a confused look, we know we maybe have to explain that. Again, so try to recreate that physical presence. That's one of the interesting challenges we are working. Uh, even so, it's not body language. I tend to use a lot of feedback tools and collaboration tools. Uh, and I mentioned a few of those in the slides here, if you're interested. And the key point here is instantaneous feedback. I'm not using surveys because that's kind of too long and it's not immediate feedback. But when I talked before about cutting down lectures into smaller segments and uh, infusing activities, that's the easiest way to go. And of course, when the session starts, I mentioned the eight in the morning thing, uh, we need to do a bit of a wake up activity, make it clear. It's not just you switch on like a YouTube stream and relax and of course do your email in between or um, uh, yeah, move away mentally. So I 
tend to do a wake up activity. And of course, learning is a social activity for most of us. So wakeouts, having pair work, having things coming back, uh, that's maybe even more important in an online learning environment. I like the combination of uh, asking questions, having a, a conversation, like we hopefully will have in a couple of minutes time now, and at the same time, having chat. Actually, a chat or a Q and a it's one of the advantages, one of the strengths from online learning over residential learning. Because when you let students speak up and ask questions and request comments and stimulate them in class, it's always only one student at a time who can speak. In chat, there is a it's more impaler, there is more participation, more engagement. So that's certainly uh, good. So, and yes, you mentioned office hours. I actually switched my office hours uh, to evening simply because it didn't happen at the time when it need to happen at the time and for, for a long time not allowed to happen at the time when I was at the department. So uh, it's a different timing context here as well. Finally, a few words with regards to learning media. Of course, we've been uh, actively supporting student learning for residential students with learning management platforms. Um, used them much more intensively now in the times of COVID. And uh, over a graduate or undergraduate program, I believe it's important to have them go away. They should not perceive this overhead to get to something. Just be quite natural. It's a learning operating system. So that's why I recommend to my peers in my department to all of us use the same structure and the same platform. Uh, I do not recommend students, even so it's technically possible, to just follow lectures, follow classes on the smartphone, uh, because the overall setting to make yourself, bring yourself into a learning framework uh, that works better when you work with a screen, be that a desktop or a tablet. Uh, one of my students recently actually told me otherwise. Yeah. Uh, he said, no, this e-learning thing that doesn't work for him. And it was a e. uh, he said, when I was asking him after an online exam, how things are going, how semester's going, he said, no, he's, he's kind of skipped that semester because whenever he sits down in front of a computer, then his mind switches over to gaming and he cannot use the computer for learning uh, for him. It's a gaming engine. Well, I hope that's not the case for everyone and that that's the exception. But I like to have students working on kind of a workplace and use the smartphone as a feedback channel. So the quiz can be answered there. They can pick up like we had it before, a QR code and uh, go off to some kind of activity. I, I still have to make up my mind about lecture recordings. Actually, I I record them, but I, I tend to keep that under wraps and make it not too explicit, not pointing out to students that those are available. Make them available maybe with some time delay, because I want to avoid that uh, participants, students uh, get the impression, well, I can always follow that later. I want them to join me at eight, because learning in particular for those undergraduate students who involuntarily switched over from classroom mode to online mode. For them, the synchronous components, uh, I believe, uh, for many of them at least, are key to success in class. So it's to a large degree about recreating a lively online classroom experience. And that brings me to my expectation for the coming semester, um, where we maybe, likely, will have kind of a mix of in-class and online experience. I've done that a couple of years ago when I was a visiting professor at Canterbury University in New Zealand. Uh, and that's the ultimate challenge because all of us are quite experienced with in-class teaching. Uh, many of us, most of us do have experience with online instruction, but mixing these, talking at the same time to students in class, face-to-face, -face, uh, and those who are remote, uh, as I said, I do have limited experience, but that's kind of the hard one. Yeah, with that, I'd look forward to the discussion and back to Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. So much stuff there.
you know, Joseph, uh, in particular, you know, you, um, you shared an anecdote uh, just towards the end there about a student who, um, you know, was not used to, was very uh, digitally aware, you know, and certainly not a stranger to online technology, but was a, um, was a stranger in terms of learning. That wasn't, you being online was not a context in which this person learned. And so when you shared that with me the first time, I that really kind of struck home to me because I come at my um, online teaching with a certain preconception about um, my audience and especially in terms of sometimes of their generation. And so that's unfair of me and, uh, and as you've shown, could be mistaken. Um, but one of the other things is you, you actually, in your uh, presentation, you you pointed out some specific resources, Poly, V, Kahoot, Slido, things like that, that um, I'm aware of some of those, but not others. And uh, anybody you know, in the presentation today can Google those things. But if you have some specific links that you want to share in the Q&A, you know, I encourage you to do that as well. Um, so you have three different, um, uh, three different, presenters, three different kind of, I guess we could say approaches or at least three different contexts for online learning. Uh, but I think we start, we started to see some patterns um, develop there in their presentations. One that I saw was variety, um, flexibility, flexibility, you know, the ability to um, change according to the needs or the situation of the class, and then also a variety of different learning um, mediums, you know, so from using hands-on activities to using breakout rooms to using polls to just changing it up and as a means of keeping students engaged. So anyway, I just want to kind of go ahead and answer some of our questions. We've got, you know, about uh, 15 minutes left in the session, and we had some terrific questions come in. And so, yeah, uh, looking at these, they, they, some of them came in for uh, specific people too. Now, since I'm already talking, I'm going to be quiet here in just a second, but um, one of them that came in was just addressed to anyone and had to do with the use of Learn ArcGIS, which Charlotte brought up as kind of a template for the way that she designed some of her own lessons, you know, and uh, Learn Ar ArcGIS tutorials um, or Esri, you know, Esri Academy web courses and materials like that, and whether we should feel lazy about utilizing those too much. And so I decided to field this one when it came up, just as the Esri member on the panel. Um, uh, and I would say unequivocally, you should not feel lazy in utilizing those resources. The only, in my opinion, the only reason that you should feel lazy about using those resources a lot is if you use them in a lazy way as a teacher. And so, if you're using them in a way to fill time, or if you're using them when they are not relevant to one of your learning objectives, then yeah, that's lazy. But it doesn't have anything to do with the source of the materials. It's just in the, in the manner in which they're being used. So as you know, someone from Esri, I would encourage you to use those resources when they're applicable, and then put your um, uh, attention and your effort into designing other types of activities, other types of learning engagements uh, for your students. So uh, anyway, that's my opinion on that. And our other panelists can share uh, their opinions as well. But let's get to some of these other questions. Uh, this one, uh, Beth, would you like to answer? It says, Beth, I, if I heard correctly, you mentioned voice threads. I heard yeah. that too, and I was wondering if you could just expand on that. Sure, sure, yeah. It's a, it's a really great tool. Um, you should check it out. It's basically, if you think of a threaded discussion, but add all 
kinds of different multimedia. So the way we use it in the class that I mentioned, we'll have a little case study in GIS each lesson and it's a little video uh, with us talking and, and walking through this case study. It's a nice short little um, video and then we have students respond to it and they can add video of themselves uh, responding to it. They can just do a, an audio recording. They can type a response. They can respond to each other that way and it, it threads it so that you can respond to somebody else and it, it doesn't have to be live so you can come back and watch it later and it, it's just a really nice interactive way to have a discussion but able to be able to incorporate um, videos and audio and images and different things like that. So it's really, um, it's really interactive. And interactivity is one of those things yeah. that really can <laughs> increase engagement. Yeah. Yes. Oh, thanks, Beth. Charlotte, how about this one? Um, you mentioned the think, pair, share kind of approach. Um, can you talk a, a little bit about how you get that to work online? It sure. sounds like some of our, our um, you know, participants are aware of that a, a approach in a conventional classroom, but what about online? Sure, and I, I would like to address the question about using Esri's Learn Lessons. The thing about that, it's not the entire course. I mean, the, um, the online or applied GIS for public health course, it has other components too, like lectures. They're getting the theory from me verbally, but to learn by doing, like how do we show how to do a or how do we learn how to do a proximity analysis? You run through a tutorial and then you use it with your own data. So um, just to address that, I, I, I know that the Esri Learn Lesson team under Riley Peak puts a lot of time into troubleshooting. So at least there's some QAQC on top of those lessons. And it's sort of in lieu of a textbook. In the same way, I, I wouldn't hesitate to use a textbook, these learn lessons are even more up to date. They're going to coincide with the most current version of ArcGIS Online. So they're actually better than a textbook, I think, for that purpose. But getting to the question of think, pair, share, at Berkeley, we use Zoom as the platform, uh, not for our online co course. The online course, like Beth's course at Penn State, uh, actually where my husband is enrolled in their certificate program, um, for our online Master of Public Health, those are synchronous classes, so um, we use Zoom when we have, um, sorry, they're asynchronous, and we use Zoom for office hours or the initial launch. And that's another thing I wanted to mention about um, going, moving from campus to online. I think it's still important to have a synchronous launch where it's possible or where you have students in the Eastern Hemisphere that you might need to do in a 9 a.m. and a 9 p.m. course launch, something like that to get everybody on board of this is what we're going to do this semester. We're all part of this community. You might be self-identifying as LGBTQ, as disabled, as, you know, with re identifying in a certain ethnicity. We want to identify as a collective and you know, learning together in this course. So I think a, a launch is important. And doing that, sort of being all together, then that pair share, or think pair share, when we're in um, a Zoom format, because for my class that's usually on campus, I still want them to have that class time set aside that that's where they're engaged in that class. And, you know, where they can sit in the class in a classroom for 90 minutes without a problem. They really can't do that online. So these sort of breakouts, you know, with Zoom, it's easy to make a random breakout. I'm just pairing out students and they need to explain to each other some concepts. So I might, you know, say, okay, we're gonna break out and I want you to explain how we uh, set the reference dose based on the dose response curve that you learned, you know, a few minutes ago in this talks lecture, something like that. Mm -hmm. Terrific. All right. Yeah. So <clears throat> um, I think that a lot of others are probably using Zoom as well, but uh, I've used other online training platforms um, 
uh, WebEx and GoToMeeting and stuff, I think that would actually be appropriate in those uh, tools as well. How about this one? I, it, it's come up a couple of times in a little bit different ways, but it has to do with um, evaluation. So one question specifically targets cheating, you know, and, and another question kind of treats it more broadly. Um, but what are you doing in your online classes, Beth? I'm, you know, and, and well, actually all three of you, you've been doing this for a while before the pandemic. So what were your methods of, um, you know, maintaining integrity and evaluation? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll start. Um, we, really, we really try to focus on academic integrity in the first class that most of our students take in our program and just kind of really talk about it a lot. We have them take a little academic integrity quiz that they have to pass in order to, to continue. In that class, we actually use some um, software like Turnitin, for example. I don't know if anybody has ever used that, but it checks, um, yeah, it, it checks text that students turn in and, and um, searches the web and make sure that there aren't chunks of text uh, taken from elsewhere. So we really just hammer it home in that first class of how important academic integrity is, really teaching citations and just all of that information and um, by focusing on it there, we have found that we don't need to do it as much in classes that follow because it just really kind of prepares them. Um, it's also, it's not to say that there aren't people who aren't honest, but a lot of these students, they're self-motivated, they're working professionals, they need to, you know, they're, they're doing these classes on their own and need the, the knowledge. So, um, a lot of times they, it, it may not be as much of a problem. Um, another thing that we kind of focus on is, is a lot of our quizzes are open. So we allow them to have them be open books. So we make sure that they are, um, you know, really testing what they have learned throughout and not just have it be um, something that are like trick questions that they um, might have trouble answering. So we really try to focus on having them um, really understand the the text and the projects and everything um, in order to be able to have an open book test or quiz. So, and then again, a lot of our projects, a lot of our ass assessments are projects that they turn in that have to be individualized. So those are just some of the things that we do. Good. Yeah. Joseph I, and Charlotte, I, do you have anything to add? I agree with Beth about having um, these assessments that, yeah, I mean, for the big undergrad classes, we have quizzes. I have a daily quiz actually that they do can do right on their phone. And that's, you know, just really um, easy, low stakes. And that's, I think the key, those things um, that lend themselves to cheating, like exams and quizzes, those in the assessment are lower points in the end. And those things which absolutely have to be done on their own, like the, the term paper, which really demonstrates in the uh, intro to environmental health science, they're demonstrating their understanding of toxicology, exposure assessment, risk assessment, mitigation, all of that in the term paper. It's pretty hard. The only way to really cheat is to use another paper. And we do have that software like Turnitin that would catch that. But that's a much higher point value for the, the grade at the end. And yeah, I mean, the uh, 200 class undergrads <laughs> that you know, are motivated to go to med school or grad school, there's a big motivation to cheat there. So we have to really think about balancing you know, how, we, how we grade at the end. It, and like Beth said, for the mid-career professionals, they're there to learn. They're not interested in, you know, they know that cheating, they're not going to meet their goals. So that's, it's not really an issue there. Joseph, I'm going to like just extend that question just a little bit, you know, for um, when we're not talking about like formal evaluation, but we're talking about what, you know, can be called just a test for understanding. You know, when I'm teaching in a conventional classroom, I'm looking out at the students and I'm interpreting a lot of their, their verbal and nonverbal cues as whether they're getting it or not. You know, I see the eyebrows raised, I see the nodding of the heads, you know, somebody ask a question and stuff. 
in an online environment, do you have any techniques for, you know, that sort of informal testing of understanding? <clears throat> Are you using video or, or what other kinds of uh, um, techniques do you use? Yeah, well, video clearly is, is limited with the, with the cast size, uh, with the number of simultaneous interactions. Uh, one positive experience I had, which I expected not to work that well, is to put students on the spot because I, I got a couple of questions from students and it was directly asking one or another student I hadn't heard from in a while. And I would, I, I feel a bit uncomfortable doing that in class. So I felt, well, should I even try to do that in an online setting? And by and large, I was positively surprised that um, uh, students were on their toes. They were there, they responded even when I, I just wanted to raise awareness that I wanted everyone to listen. So that worked. Uh, sometimes things work out better than uh, we would. Let me add one point to the exam uh, and assessment thing, because that would be a big other discussion as well. Uh, I moved uh, over the years for practicals, for assignments uh, from the good old demo and exercise data sets over to the living atlas. So if any activity is to be done, any analytical step, I had everyone pick their own location. And of course, when we, as long as we provide the data sets, uh, that's hard because they're all on the same page, literally. Um, I say, well, take your grandmother's birthplace or your favorite location destination and do analysis X around this place. Uh, so it's all about individualization of responses, of course, of learning and then assessment. Uh, clearly, it's a bit more effort to check out uh, whether they've done a good job with that. But I really love the individualization opportunities given to us by global data sets, Living Atlas and other ones. Awesome, awesome. Well, you know, as a, as a, uh, a long time Esri instructor, um, I, I shared Joseph's trepidation about calling on students individually by name, you know, to answer questions. And then <clears throat> I had a discussion with one of the legendary Esri instructors, a fellow named Jack Horton, um, who uses this with a lot of success. And he told me that prior to class or at the beginning of class, he would let everyone know that he's gonna call on them by name. You know, and they will be answering questions frequently throughout the class. Uh, but he says, if this makes you uncomfortable in any way, just send me a private uh, chat message or email um, and then I'll just, I, I won't do it. And he hardly ever gets anyone indicating that they would prefer not to be called on. And, um, and it is a, terrific way he keeps his class engaged because people are going, well, he might call on me, so I better be ready. All right. Well, everyone, we have a lot of other great questions to get to. Maybe we can talk about these tomorrow at the social hour. Um, you know, so I do hope that you will uh, attend and jump into that part of it and even share some of your own thoughts as well. Uh, but just to wrap up here, um, when we think about getting more help, uh, I would encourage you to look for a mentor. You've heard from three very experienced people this morning. Um, look around for, you know, on your campus and your institution uh, for someone that you believe does this really well and ask them for help if you, if you think that you want to improve in this area. Um, also connect with your colleagues in your institution. It's actually it's probably likely that there's already kind of a meetup or a user group for something like this. So look for that. And the higher ed listserv counts as well. We are a large community of users and it's one of the, one of the nice things about GIS and higher ed GIS in particular is the willingness of people to share best practices in a graceful way. That's something that I've noticed over the years. And then there are professional training options that you might want to consider. Uh, just, I, I mentioned CompTIA here. CompTIA is an organization that does a certification specifically for virtual trainers, uh, but there are others as well. And so there's opportunities for you to explore some of those to even get some professional credentialing. 